questions um, that have been out there, but um, I know some of you all may have other questions you want to bring up. So um, feel free to do that. I do know, again, we're, we're really trying to stay in communication with everybody to let everybody know what's going on. There are a lot of things right now that we just don't know. Um, and even with this phase one, um, you know, reopening of the government or of society in Virginia, there's lots of things that it allows us to do and there's a lot that it doesn't. And there's probably is in some ways more challenges with things reopening than there have been uh, with things not. So, so feel free to, to ask away. Hey, Carrie. I think yeah. there's one thing that we didn't uh, talk about or didn't think about in our meeting when we started going over all this stuff was uh, what are the cemetery? Uh, has anybody looked into or did the governor's order? I didn't see anything in there about it, about cemeteries allowing, you know, uh, more people. So if we did a ceremony at Augusta and the family wanted to go in procession to Forest Lawn, are they going to allow us to have 50 people out there? Yeah, it's, cemeteries would be in the same situation as churches. Every one of them may have different um, regulations and things they do. I mean, we've already seen that a little bit. I've seen some cemeteries or even church columbariums tell families. I, I had an internment at St. Michael's last week and Deacon Dave over there was like, oh, well, you know, as long as you know, 20, 30 people come, I'm fine with that, it's outside, and, you know, if, and if where Mount Calvary, I know, is hard on 10 people, you know, including the priest, Bethel's the same way with the, yeah. you know, with, with how many people can be there, so it's really, again, these are added challenges to, to all of our directors and staff to kind of, you know, find out exactly what these locations are, are offering and allowing. I'm Carrie. Yeah, Lisa. Um, I understand that we're going to have services up to 50 people. Mm -hmm. And so how do you explain to someone, we're not having visitation still, right? How do you, you know, I know they're having a clergy. Mm -hmm. How do you? Um, you know, to me, the, the, the only way that we can really do that, Lisa, is just base. All we can do is, is what we're allowed to do by the government. And the governor in this, you know, phase one, opening has specifically said it has to, you know, it's kind of religious services. I, for us, I wouldn't get caught up necessarily on the religious side. It has to be a service. Religious religion for me and the way I practice it is how I practice it personally, but for somebody else, even something that's a more humanistic type of service, um, I think would fall, you know, in that, um, in that realm of things. But what, it, if, if you read the language that's there, it's very, specific about not having extended gatherings kind of socialization things it's more specific for the ceremony itself yeah. if i can add to that too i think part, one of the big differences between the ceremony and the visitation is that in the ceremony people are seated they're not moving around mm -hmm. They're stable in one place, whereas a visitation, they're always walking right by each other, next mm -hmm. to each other, breathing on each other, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So, you yeah. Know, so it's kind of a, a, a different ball game. But now we'll I say that, so, so John, that's one thing I will definitely say too is, you know, especially with like the use, uh, the governor has been very, um, you know, insistent about highly recommending utilizing like face coverings and things like that, especially on, you know, on ceremonies. It's one thing when we're here at the funeral home and if you've got a, you're making arrangements with a family and you can easily kind of social distance yourself. But, you know, I know for staff, um, you know, it's really important to use good protocols, procedures, you know, I would certainly highly recommend, you know, require kind of staff to wear like a face covering if you're out on a service. It's very hard to engage people um, in like a church or a closed confined space of when you have 50 or more people, um, you know, without, you know, can, without having to get somewhat closer to them. So I think those are the types of things we're going to really have to kind of look at and really try to, to, to see how they're done. I know Bethel Cemetery, for instance, they required two weeks ago that any of our staff that comes out there has to be have not just a mask, but they actually require gloves too. Um, and we may see more of that as well from some of these um, facilities. I, I know one challenge 
Um, the Catholic Diocese of Richmond, I know, is in the process today of having a webinar for all their parishes throughout the diocese and kind of setting kind of what the guidelines are going to be. And then each parish has to put together a protocol or a plan in place, you know, as far as how they're going to reopen. Um, obviously, I, from what I had seen, a lot of things you're going to find churches that do require masks to be worn or gloves or distancing or how those types of things are structured. And those are things that we're going to have to really look at on a case by case, you know, location specific thing to see how those things are, are done and what, what our offerings can be. Definitely going to be a challenge for us, um, you know, going, uh, going through in the next, uh, next few, uh, you know, few minutes of things or next few, few weeks. So. Yeah. Another question, Carrie, do you have any sense of how many people, want to do a celebration when everything opens up. Has, has there been much input about that? I know I've gotten a few uh, who yeah. have requested that. Yeah, I mean, there definitely has been. Um, I, I know each location is trying to kind of keep a running list of kind of, you know, families that are wanting to be engaged or looking at doing something. I, I, the only challenge I think I, we will see from that, um, Jenny Moss and I went to a, a conference that, uh, Alan Wolfelt did back in November out in Chicago. And the one thing that Wolfelt said, which is very true or has been over the years, 70% of families that say they're going to do something down the road don't. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that percentage may be a little higher this go round. But I mean, when you've had somebody that, you know, their loved one died in March or April and things don't open enough, open up enough until who knows, summer, fall, <laughs> next year I, you know i think it's it's just going to be you know for them it's like they have moved on in their own lives and in their own grief journey you know some of them aren't going to want to go back um you know back to that you know to that level or it may be some a different type of gathering and that's what's going to be really interesting for us is trying to engage families and find different ways for us to to do that it may not be the traditional religious service they were looking at doing maybe it's a picnic gathering or just a you know, something social instead of necessarily having a religious component. Other questions people have? Speaking now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> um, I do want to say though, like like I said just a, a little while ago, I think you know, with this phase one um, reopening, there's a lot of unknown that we have right now. I mean, just because people can have services doesn't mean that they will. Um, but at the same time, there are things that we can do now that we weren't able to do, you know, right now or the last few weeks. Um, so I, I do think we're going to start seeing some more church service offerings, um, things like that. And especially as we're able to do more, we certainly will be able to engage more staff, um, especially our part-time staff, in helping with these, um, these different types of services based on, on what you all um, want to do. Um, I do know one thing that um, Bob Brown did do, and, and the location managers before, I guess back in March when things were starting, um, so I would, you know, have you follow back with Bob um, or the location managers. I'm sure they'll be reaching out to over the next few weeks, but is, uh, I know we had kind of created a list of people that wanted to work if they could, or people that did not and wanted to stay quarantined. Um, so if that's something, if you've kind of changed your perspective on what you kind of originally said, if you're somebody who originally wanted to be quarantined and now you want to be kind of on the list to call back. Um, I would let that manager know, um, you know, where you fall, just so that way we kind of have a list of people we know that, that want to be called and we can engage, and then people that, that don't want to be until they let us know otherwise. Um, I think those are just things that would help us. Um, again, we just really don't know what, how this process is going to ramp up, um, but it's, it's good for us to, to know. Carrie, as I was reading some of the um, verbiage attached to the email, it said that each location was to have signage to say 
that these are the guidelines. Do we have those at the front um, of every building? And it also suggested that we use a one-way entry and another way exit. Are we going to practice that? It did. Um, I do know we're working on um, the signage and the exit entry stuff is some stuff that I do know the management team is working on. Um, special thanks to them. They have done a great job on trying to address everything that's spelled out in there in that letter and actually tried to create kind of like a almost a spreadsheet kind of checklist of how we can kind of go through and kind of work through all this. Um, everything from timing of services, cleanliness checks as far as what needs to be cleaned, as far as, um, you know, different, one of the things that's in that memo is not really having things for people to pass around, you know, or things that are touched by multiple people. So if we do have, say, prayer cards or things like that, having stacks for people to take for something that's passed out or having multiple places where there's limited exposure um, for that. So all those things will be kind of addressing. The um, other thing we really try to do throughout all the locations is, Stacy, to your point is keeping, I know one of the other things that's in there is keeping doors open. Um, so that way there's limited, you know, opening and closing of doors. Um, obviously in places like bathrooms, that's kind of a challenge. Um, but, you know, we're somewhat fortunate at locations. Um, we do have multiple points of entry and exit really everywhere, probably except for Augusta and Hamilton. Augusta and Hamilton is probably the biggest challenge. Um, the positive there is we really have, the, you know, that have at least the double door um, for people. And if we do have a ceremony, it is, you know, we would be able to let people kind of exit through the chapel doors in the front um, to kind of create that, that flow. But those are, those are the challenges that are gonna be coming up the next couple of weeks. Um, we, you know, we really haven't, it's kind of new ter territory for us. So it, I think where we start may not be where we finish. Um, you know, we'll kind of see how things progress and, and be ready to adapt. I, I think all of us right now, especially those of us, you know, in management have to be willing to be super flexible. <laughs> we can't get caught up in, you know, here's our policy for today. So this is what we're going to do throughout. This is a, a revolving, you know, uh, evolving type of change. And we have to be willing to, to adapt as things go. Other questions? I know we got a, several people on this call, Molly, uh, Keela and Ron, John, you know, the Johns you know, that are usually never short on, on asking questions. So I'm kind of disappointed in you all for not asking. <laughs> I think you've done a great job. I don't have any questions. I think you've done a wonderful job and I think um, I can speak for most of us that whatever you all do and decide, we're 100% supportive of you and Blyley. And thank yeah. you for all that you're doing right now. Well, thanks, Keila. It's definitely been a challenge on all of us to, uh, you know, to, to try to run ahead of stuff, but it's been uh, a true team effort. Everybody here is, is pitching in and doing what needs to be done. Um, like I said, uh, I mean, just the whole situation with Lindsay, man, picking up, you know, doing cremations. I mean, I think that that's, all those things are huge help and it really, everybody has tried to, to do what they can. Um, I, I will say even Mike Williams working at the front desk here at Augusta and Hamilton, <laughs> you know, Mike's done a really good job of, of, you know, picking up something that's not in his normal um, thing to do. And he's done a pretty good job of it. So. Um, also, I guess since he's on the phone or since he's on the call too, I'm just going to, do a shout out to John Hancock. I know John, um, when things kind of initially, you know, got out there, John was a huge help to different um, part-time staff and kind of letting people know how to navigate kind of some of the unemployment channels and just kind of being a great resource for, uh, for that. So special shout out to John and, and all he's done um, to, to help everybody here and kind of let his, kind of help them navigate from his experience and stuff. I don't know why. <laughs> Good. Well, any last questions anybody has? I'm glad to see that the signage is going to be put up. Uh, mm -hmm. I know at a uh, supposedly an ID view the other day, uh, it was kind of chaotic at the front desk. And mm -hmm. I think signage at the doors uh, is a must. 
It is, and I think that's also the importance of scheduling too right now. I mean, you know, you really have to be smart about how we try to schedule stuff. And that's, that's easier said than done, um, obviously.